from slave cabin to the White House. Uh, I'm, I, you know, we were just talking about this country's foundational uh, economy was enslaving Africans, right? And uh, I guess, you know, we have not left that, I feel, in many ways, which is why when they say make America great again, they want to go back to those days of subjugation and dehumanization and oppression, which never really left. It keeps forming in different pockets. But you take us from the slave cabins to the White House, which I guess is a nod to President Obama. Um, mm-hmm. Talk about what inspired your book and what you want us to walk away with. Oh, thank you so much. So from slave cabins to the White House, it really is my way of dealing with just how much, to your point, the United States is built on a process of basically constantly putting Black people back in their so-called proper place. And the reason I even went there is because my first book, Living with Lynching, taught me that you weren't lynched because you were a criminal. You were targeted by the mob because you were successful in some way. You had land white folk wanted to take. You wanted to protect your daughter or your wife from sexual harassment and abuse. Oh, well, you don't know your proper place, Black man. Let me put you in your place and let me terrorize your entire family and community while I'm at it. So living with lynching taught me that that is what violence in this country is about, putting us back in our so-called proper place, know your place aggression. So my thing was not only is that the case, but black people have always known that that's the case, right? So in living with lynching, I'm studying these plays about lynching written before 1930. And over and over again, you have characters and you have authors who know that it's their success that beckons the mob. So my thing was, if my ancestors always knew that, then how can I read their literature with any faithfulness if I'm not acting like I know that too? So if I approach our Black literary tradition looking for protest, looking how, for how we're arguing that we're human, please see we're human, please. If I think that's what we're doing, I've missed the boat. What they have shown me over and over again is like, no, it's because we're successful that they're trying to put us back in our proper place. So to begin from slave cabins and go all the way to the White House is to actually trace that movement. And what I'm struck by is even in enslavement. One perfect example is uh, Harriet Jacobs, who wrote Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, the first book-length autobiography by a formerly enslaved African-American woman. What she makes clear is that simply knowing that she is human and not a piece of property is a victory that this country does not leave unaddressed. Not only does her so-called owner try to put her back in her proper place as a chattel, but so does the entire US government by passing the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. So let's be clear, it is not about protest. It's about the fact that white supremacy knows that it's not supreme. So it's always pouncing to try to put you back in your proper place because it knows that it is the reaction. It's not that we protest against the violence. We are doing our thing, mar- marching toward achievement, and white reaction keeps trying to put us back in our proper, proper place. So um, that's why I wrote the book. Because I'm like, let's read the record right. (laughs) Lindsay Rose, she came ready. Yes, she understood the assignment, everyone. Uh, Her name is Dr. Caritha Mitchell. Uh, I want to find out a little bit more about you. You can follow her at Prof. uh, K-A-R-I. No, Corey. Sorry, K-O-R-I. I can't read. P-R-O-F-K-O-R-I for Caritha. uh, At Prof. Corey on Twitter and CarithaMitchell.com. I want to sit in this space because um, it's something that I know, like with every, but they, I've always known, you know, and Toni Morrison says, you know, I've always known I was morally superior that, that my father, you know, he, he would always, you know, <laughs> my father was the same way and it's not morally superior from the standpoint that I'm superior, but 
my morality tells me something's wrong. And if you don't know something's wrong, you're morally inferior, period, full stop. What do we do with that? From Rosewood to Greenwood to Eatonville to, you know, we keep going, Red Summer of 1919, the audacity of Black people coming back from World War I to wear a uniform, to fight for freedoms that they didn't have here, the audacity to have a piano, the audacity to have a thriving community that, you know, that had oil, the, the audacity to have, the audacity to be, the audacity to hold your head up high and not jump off of a curb for somebody, for another human being, was the thing that got people lynched in this country. You're saying that. Today is the thing, the uppity, your uppity, what they'll do is they'll say you're an angry Black woman if they can't shut you up. They, they, they'll disparage you in so many different ways that you'll challenge yourself. And I guess the goal is to, to make us afraid to succeed. Is that the goal to make black people afraid to actually be their full, happy, successful selves? Is that the goal? In so many ways, this is such a beautiful question because in so many ways, I think there are so many goals, right? Like one of the goals I think is to keep the standards incredibly low for the archetypal citizen, right? What we have done is we have built an entire nation on the idea that the only real citizen, the only person who truly belongs is the cisgender straight white man. How do I make sure that even when that archetypal citizen fails to live up to anything the country says it respects. I don't know morality. I don't know decency. I don't know a basic work ethic. When he fails to live up to any basic standard, how does he still justify being on the top of the pyramid? I think you do it through that know your place aggression. Every single time someone else succeeds by the exact same standards you say you respect, you question their ability. You denigrate them. You cast them as angry. You cast them like all of the things that we're familiar with, right? And I think that's how you do it. You keep the standard low for cisgender straight white men by having everybody else's mm. sense of belonging challenged at every turn. I mean, at every turn. And so to my mind, part of what is important about understanding that it is the success of marginalized groups that inspires aggression part of the power of knowing that is knowing that you didn't do anything wrong when they come after you it's because you're doing so much right they have put every barrier in your way and you're still succeeding harriet jacobs had every barrier in her way and she's still flexing what so I think that if we understand that, then we don't internalize the BS because it's only when we believe the lie that we don't actually look around our surroundings and notice just how mediocre white folk are. Like, how do you actually become excellent when you're never expected to be? And that's the situation that has been constructed. So when I look around, I'm rarely impressed. The goal is to make sure that you never notice that, that you never notice there's nothing to be impressed by, that you never notice that, oh, these straight white men who are in positions of power, they aren't admirable. They're just licensed by every structure they've created. Uh, Shavar, okay. I know. <laughs> Listen, she came to slay. Um, Shavar, it's hold on. On her on birthday. For on her birthday, you better say all of the things. Dr. Caritha Mitchell has arrived. Um, I was watching, I was mentioning uh, CBS Sunday morning is one of my guilty pleasures on the weekend. I, only when Jane Pauley is there. Um, and they did this whole thing on Harvey Weinstein and they talk about all these great movies. But, you know, he would fight people and yell at people and scream at people, which is, again, it's like anybody else behaving in that way. You would be seen as unhinged, as somebody that can't control your emotions. But that gave him license to then, then take it and abuse women. And hundreds of women came forward, but they accepted it. And it's much like a lot of things we accept we were talking about in our community. To me, there's a bleed over, you know, the, what you accept in one area really, to me, determines who you are and where your, where your barometer is. But I was like, I know so many people in power who throw things, who yell and scream, who are white. A black person rarely can get away with that unless they work for BET. I said it. Uh, but, you know, by and large, that's acceptable behavior. And then he got credited with 
doing all of these movies, not the people that wrote the movies, the directors, the, the actual creatives, but because he could bankroll it and green light something, he was somehow he got all these Oscars, right? And then they set up the award system so that you get credited for your mediocrity. And then we all aspire to have your mediocre statue. Come on, Dr. Caritha, tell me what the hell, the hell is going on here. That you laid it out, you laid it out. So part of what you're helping me think through is let's be real, y'all. Like, let's just really read our surroundings with rigor. And to do that basically means that we start to notice that the way things are set up is that people aren't judged by behavior, they're judged by demographic. And what you just laid out is exactly that premise, that it's not behavior that gets judged, it is the demographic. If I fit the right category of what this nation says it's supposed to respect, then whatever I do, all of a sudden is okay. And part of what I think is so important about recognizing that is that it allows us to actually have our own standards such that we actually can, as you said, like you set that system up to where now I'm supposed to aspire to what they said. No, when I recognize that it is demographic that people are being rewarded for and not behavior, I can divest from that system and really care much more about what I believe should be lauded. So yeah, I think you laid it out perfectly. I, I would love to because you put so much on the table, uh, Dr. Mitchell. I think your piece about race and mediocrity is really powerful, right? Because um, people oftentimes say, well, Barack Obama was elected president and, uh, you know, and, and Robert Smith is a billionaire. Black folk have, have progressed. And I'd always say, no, when Black people can be as mediocre as the average white person and get to the same space, then that would be a measure of, of progress. Um, but I'm really curious because you talked about how recognizing these dynamics is so key. How do we teach our young people? You know, Carter Woodson and Miss Education Negro talked about how, as you're putting on the table, all of this is constructed so we can believe the lie. So we don't even recognize the truth. So we think the lie is the truth. How do we deliver a kind of education to our young people so that they can recognize some of uh, the dynamics you've described so that can then put them on a pathway toward liberation? Thank you for that. Um, you know, what I love about how you laid that out too is I want us to really think about the way that as it's set up right now, if people are rewarded for demographic, how they're read rather than for behavior, then part of what you have to notice is how the standards that are stated actually end up just being a bludgeon to punish other people, right? So it's like, I say that I care about work, that work ethic as an American. That's what we say <laughs> as a mainstream society. But indeed, what we end up doing is using work ethic as just a bludgeon against the people that we wanna keep in their so-called proper place, not an actual standard that if you're a straight white man, you're held to. So I want us to know that, notice that bludgeon um, function. And so for, for my money, part of why understanding know your place aggression is useful, and certainly I care about like helping younger people understand this too, right? Because part of the reason I'm so clear about this, part of the reason I can look around my surroundings and see the white mediocrity and shrug it off in terms of the way that they try to put me back in my place, Part of the reason I can do that is because I used to believe the lies so, so extensively. So it's like once I unlearn that BS, I will never go back. Um, so part for me of the power of practicing noticing these dynamics is that it allows you to use your power, use your energy on purpose for creating what you want to see. Part of what I find so powerful about this show and everything that Karen Hunter is building is that it's really all around community conversation. And even the, the question you've offered to me right now is about community conversation. How do we as a community 
challenge each other, debate each other just as importantly, right? Like part of what I find so striking about this entire channel is the way that it's all about, I care enough about my community to debate you about it. So my definition of success might differ from yours, but we're in community because we're going to debate about it. And that's what I trace in from slave cabins to the White House. When you're going literally from slave cabins to the White House, what you will see is that Africa African descended people have never agreed on the definition of success or how to get to it. And so what I'm interested in is how can we maximize the energy that we have to debate each other in love? And I think the way we do that is that we're not wasting the energy worried about somebody else's assessment of me as a angry black woman or whatever. Like when I don't give my energy to worrying about, oh, did that happen to me at work because I did something wrong? Nah, girl, it happened because you're doing it all right. When I can do that, then that means my energy goes to where I want it to go, which is to support my community, my family, and making this country somewhat decent while I'm here in the exact same way that all of my ancestors did their part and, and, and work for things that they never got to benefit from. Dr. Caritha Mitchell is here. The book is From Slave Cabins to the White House, Homemade Citizenship in African-American Culture. Homemade Citizenship in African-American Culture. What does that mean? Absolutely. So I define homemade citizenship as a deep sense of success and belonging in the midst of violence. Homemade citizenship is what I trace being cultivated throughout African-American literature and culture from slave cabins to the White House. I trace that cultivation of homemade citizenship by looking at how Black people debated each other about the definition of success. Because what I'm interested in is we are always marching toward accomplishment. The only reason why the literary tradition even speaks about white violence is because as we march toward accomplishment, here comes white violence to try to stop our progress. It is not that we are reacting to white violence. White violence is reacting to us. And so what I'm interested in tracing is how do you continue to have a deep sense of success and belonging when you are bludgeoned at every turn? when you are in the midst of violence, when you are punished for every measure of your success, the success of knowing you're human and not chattel in the enslavement era, the success of being, I don't know, fly like Michelle Obama and everybody's still coming after you and calling you a monkey. Like, how do you still have a sense of success and belonging in the midst of all of those attacks? And I believe the way that we have done that as a people, specifically in these United States, right? Because there's always been debate, maybe we should get the hell out of here, right? And so there's always been debate. What I trace in From Slave Cabins to the White House is, okay, among the people who said, we're gonna stay here instead of immigrating to Liberia or different places, we're gonna stay here and we're gonna fight it out because this is our birthright to be here. Among those people, what did the debate look like among them? And what I argue is that the way that you have homemade citizenship, that deep sense of success and belonging in the midst of violence, the way that you maintain that is through community conversation, through the debate about the definition of success, the strategies towards success, because as you have that debate, you're cultivating your community and you're cultivating that sense of belonging and success that I call homemade citizenship, right? And the last thing I'll say is that the reason it's homemade, <laughs> you know, look, if I got a box cake, I got some ingredients already there, right? It's already halfway there. If I got to make it from scratch, that means I don't have the ingredients I was supposed to have. We mm. cultivate homemade citizenship because the social contract says, if you, I don't know, obey the laws, then you should be able to rely on society and the government to protect your person and property. We've never been <laughs> able to rely on that social contract, have we? So that means that my citizenship is never going to have those box ready ingredients. I'm gonna have to make it from scratch. And I argue that we make that from scratch through community conversation because we debate in love, 
We debate all the issues that are important. And in that debate, we cultivate that community. All I can do is wave. I mean, I feel like I'm in church. <laughs> I just gotta wave. Well, I mean, pass the collection plate, damn it. What Dr. Mitchell said. Oh, yes, all, so all the things. Uh, Dr. Mitchell is here. Uh, in case you, if you, your ears gotta be in your foot to quote Sylvester, to not hear what this woman is saying.